Okay, thanks everyone for coming today. Can you still hear me as I walk away? Good enough? Okay. My name is Patrick Monaghan. I'm a postdoc at the University of Minnesota with um, PD Brantley, working part time. Today I'm going to tell you about a simulation study that we've been developing to look at the effects of um, auto polyploidy on the process of genetic hitchhiking. Just a brief review of polyploidy that simply refers to the presence of, of course, there you go, the presence of additional chromosomes. And whereas we are, of course, a diploid species, polyploids are found across the tree of life, being particularly prevalent within the plant kingdom. Rough estimates between 30 to 40, 30 to 80 percent of current living species are polyploids in plants. We can divide polyploids into roughly two equivalent groups: the autopolyploids where all of your homologous chromosomes derive from the same um, ancestral species, compared to allopolyploids, where the extra chromosomes result from the hybridization, hybridization of two distinct species. So we're going to focus specifically on tetrasomic autopolyploids, which means that if we look at our tetraploid right here, these purple chromosomes, that chromosome is equally likely to pair with any of the other remaining three chromosomes. Okay, that's tetrasomic. And that's important because it gives rise to a number of what are called factor of two effects of autopolyploidy. So you can see here for a given population size and a given mutation rate, K here is ploidy. And so as ploidy increases, we expect higher rates of nucleotide polymorphism for all us being equal. We also expect higher rates of haplotype diversity. So here's ploidy again and R the per base combination. It's also known from theory that the rate of genetic drift goes down, so neutral allele frequency change is lower <clears throat> as ploidy increases. But one thing that's not very well appreciated is how polyploidy affects non-neutral allele frequency change, or the response to selection. It, is, it has actually been demonstrated theoretically back in the 70s that the response to selection, if it's due to a single polymorphic locus, is always going to be greater in diploids or lower ploidies than for the higher, higher ploidies. But this sort of um, take home message has kind of fallen off of the polyploidy community. And generally, I think when you tell people about this, you get some pushback that no, this can't possibly be true. Polyploids are just better at everything, right? <laughs> okay, so there's several things going on here then. So rates of neutral and non neutral allele frequency change is going down, diversity and recombination is going up. And then the question becomes how does all of this funnel through the process and reflect? patterns of neutral diversity around the region that is up to fixation. I'm going to keep running into that. Okay, so the structure coalescent provides a nice conceptual framework that we can start to think about these questions and untangle the various forces. So just briefly, what I've got here is a set of neutrally evolving lineages. There's a beneficial mutation that arises on this background and starts to sweep to high frequency. And so in order to observe any of the diversity in these other lineages, after the sweep happens, they have to recombine onto this haplotype while it's sweeping through the population. So clearly rates of recombination are gonna matter, but so also is the rate of fixation because the sort of width of this window is the critical time period in which recombination needs to happen. And both of these are changing as we increase ploidy. We can use this program MS cell, which implements the structured coalescent with selection, and we can really just kind of make an easy hacking move here and just sort of keep population size constant and our mutation rate and our sequence length, which is a megabase. And we can just vary K and just see how higher rates of diversity and recombination impact the diversity that we see afterwards. An important thing you have to provide in MSO with is this sweep trajectory. So then the second sort of major component of the talk is how do we generate different sweep trajectories for diploids, tetraploids, octoploids, et cetera. So I'll briefly run you through how we do this. If you recall from your early evolution classes, if we know the frequency, that was not all supposed to pop up at once, but that's all right. Uh, if we know the current frequency of the allele and we know the relative fitness of each of our genotypes, we can predict the allele frequency in the following generation, right? Hopefully most people recall that. And we can do that for an arbitrary dominance scenario, okay? When we write out sort of the crucial components for higher ploidies, you can see it gets a bit more complicated. We now need multiple dominance coefficients to specify fitness for the additional genotypes, right? And some assumptions have to be made in order to kind of compare apples to apples here. And I think this is up for debate. You can argue with me over whether or not you like how I'm implementing it. The way we're going to sort of simplify is just say that 
do the dominance coefficients follows a relationship between how many mutant alleles you have in your genotype. So in other words, the allele frequency within the individual, that's going to sort of follow a relationship with the dominance coefficient. So we can calculate allele frequency in each of our genotypes, follow those lines down, and figure out what the appropriate dominance coefficient would be under these three dominant scenarios, okay? And so if we can do that, then we can generalize this diploid form for what the frequency will be in the following generation. We can generalize that for an arbitrary ploidy. And I'm not going to give you quite enough time to stare at this equation and pull it apart, um, but if you want to talk to me afterwards, I'd be happy to kind of explain this next sort of set of figures that might be a little bit confusing. So here's what I had showed earlier. Here are the results for a tetraploid. So it's increasing fixation times, as we would expect. You'll notice, keep your eye on sort of the different dominance coefficients because that's going to become important later. And here, of course, is octoploid, again, stretching way further out and much longer fixation times. Oh, and then we're going to generate stochasticity about these expected trajectories by just sampling a number of individuals for a given ploidy level for the expected frequency in the following generation. But we do that many times, we need replicates and do some really heavy smoothing across the chromosomes. What you can generally see is this picture that for high ploidies, you get this long, narrow dip in diversity around your sweep region. But with lower ploidies, you get this kind of shallow, broad dip in diversity around the selected region. And I can actually kind of summarize that a little bit better. We can just measure these dips directly, measure the breadth when they start to dip down and the magnitude, how far down they go. And this just restates what I just told you. So deeper and narrower dips in diversity. So this is the magnitude, breadth being narrow there. Um, and higher ploidies and shallower, um, broader dips in diploids. But like I said before, multiple things are going on here, right? I can't tell you if this is due to the fact that it's allele frequency change differences that are driving this or whether it's due to the differences in diversity in their combination. So one thing you can do, and again, you can tell me if you don't like this. Uh, so uh, what I do here, I'll just show you for the additive um, scenario, the approximate fixation time for our three different ploidies that we're gonna look at is approximately another factor of two that we've kind of generated here. So it takes twice as long for the tetraploids to fix as the diploids, and then again, twice as long for the octoploids to fix compared to the tetraploids. So what I can do is basically just call this sort of a fast, a medium, and then a slow sweep and then I can pair that factorially by upping or decreasing the recombination rate or the ploidy that I'm using for calculating these values. And then we can start to disentangle sort of which of the forces are really driving the effects on diversity. And so what I'm showing you here highlighted in red, this is the data that I showed in the previous slide. So when the ploidy used here matches the ploidy used to calculate the trajectory, you see there, there, and there. Um, and then you can look across sort of these different trajectory ploidies to get the sense of how big of an effect the rate of fixation is having on driving the results. What you can see that the magnitude is largely due to the fact that we just start at a higher starting diversity with higher ploidies. But when it comes to the breadth of the dip in diversity, what seems to be largely driving what's going on is the fact that in lower ploidies, you just sweep through the population a lot faster. And that's what kind of determines how broad your signal is. Okay, so this is what I just said, higher data flow levels and breadth of signal due more fixation rate. So this is where I think things start to get kind of interesting. So I just said it was another factor of two effect, maybe not that cool. When it comes to the um, partial dominance and partial recessive mutations, so here I've changed to a uh, log scale now. And you can see for partial dominance, instead of a factor of two, you get about a factor of three in terms of the fixation time. For recessive mutations, it's much more exaggerated. So now you get about a factor of 10 in terms of the expected fixation times as we increase ploidy. And you can see this manifest as sort of a ploidy dependent effect of dominance on the signal that we get afterwards, right? So here as we look across our dominance categories, really no difference between our diploids. They start to separate in tetraploids and then in octoploids, you can see that recessive mutations are not near as deep as the other ones, which is because they sort of delay really, really long here at low frequencies before they finally reach that critical frequency and shoot up, right? So that kind of gives rise to these ploidy-dependent effects of dominance. 
So um, I'm just gonna quickly kind of translate and so I can kind of condense these um, graphs here. And instead of talking about breadth and magnitude of diversity, I'm just going to calculate the area of this triangle here to just say peak size. And that'll help me present a little bit more data a little more quickly. Okay, and what I wanna show you sort of is maintained when I do that, we still again see this kind of ploidy effect or ploidy dependent effect of dominance, but you also see this kind of marginal effect as you move across ploidies, right? Generally, the diploids have bigger peaks in total if you multiply the breadth by the width. Okay, so now that's gonna sort of let us look into measures of selection a bit more quickly. I'm gonna focus on three kind of classical measures of selection, so G is D, Bang Wu's age, and then a newer one, Zhang's E. It's okay if you haven't heard about the, all of these necessarily. What's important to know is that they're contrasting really just different parts of the allele frequency spectrum that are all expected to be equal to each other under neutrality. And they'll depart from, from those expectations in different ways um, as selection acts, okay? So what we see for that is again, we see sort of, we maintain this, for Tajima's D right here, we maintain this ploidy sort of dependence on dominance. You again see a bigger separation between our recessive mutations, apart from our adjective and dominance mutations, for higher ploidies. But whether or not there's kind of this overall marginal effect, you can kind of see a downward trend here for Tajima's D, not so much for Fei and Wu's H, and not so much for Zhang Z. You don't really see a sort of a marginal effect here. How many, how many minutes is that? Okay, yeah, I should have known. <laughs> Anyways, um, so there is actually a marginal effect that emerges here if you look at the number of my replicates where you can't actually calculate to GMSD because these both go to zero. So if it's, a, if it's a really, really hard sweep, these become undefined. And what you're seeing here, you might not be able to see from the values that, that are defined, but diploids have a much, much higher chance for these metrics to become undefined because they simply crash out all of the diversity due to that really, really fast sweep. Marginal effect, whether it's defined. Last thing that I'll kind of talk about here is that for depending on the ploidy level, the recovery of these um, parameters will differ following the, the sweep, which is what's shown here in this, um, this graph. It shows that the time after fixation, your power can drop off differently between these different metrics, right? And it makes sense in terms of how these ploidies differ. I said the rate of drift is higher in lower ploidies. <coughs> rate of drift will make your intermediate allele frequencies recover more quickly, but the mutation rate, the generation of new mutations is bigger in higher ploidies because you have more mutational targets, right? So your low frequency variants are gonna recover more quickly in higher ploidies. And you can actually see that because Tajima's D depends on theta pi, it drops off really quickly for diploids where drift is high, but it maintains for longer in higher ploidies because drift is so slow. But for things like Zhang's E, which depend on new mutations, you can see that the diploids, you know, maintain really well after a thousand generations, but the higher ploidies quickly start falling off because they start accruing these new low frequency mutations and it kills the signal in your higher ploidies, basically. So the metric specific effects of ploidy. Is that gonna stop? All right, so real quick, fundamentally changes neutral selection processes, first deals up, combination, yada yada. Um, there's a lot of consequent effects on population genetic signals. I only had a limited time to tell you about some of them. Dominance plays a bigger role in higher ploidies, and it depends on what metric you're using in terms of how long the signal will last for a given Collaborators and fun.